Weekly Show with David J. Maloney. This week, David talks to writer and director Steve Elkins. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome to everyone at home, and I would normally say our studio audience to the weekly show. I am your host, David J. Maloney. Uh, I say normally because we would usually shoot the show before a small studio audience at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, Uh, but we are still shooting from home due to coronavirus concerns. Uh, And because we are still shooting from home, filling in for our house band, The Mojiles, again with me tonight, is my son, Gianni. So the Cleveland Indians have announced they will be dropping their team name. Uh, No word on what their new name will be, uh, but I think we can safely rule out the Redskins. And the NBA has banned players from going to bars and clubs. Uh, As a result, Commissioner Adam Silver is now getting death threats from strippers. According to the CDC, the U.S. is experiencing an STD epidemic. Uh, Even so, ABC has announced it is still going forward with season 25 of The Bachelor. Oh, and have you heard about this? Ikea is no longer going to be publishing its catalog, uh, which has been around for 70 years. Uh, It was a popular catalog, considering how particularly hard it was to assemble. And the scientists are saying the first people to travel to Mars will spend 501 days cooped up in a tiny space. Uh, To prepare, they'll be flying back and forth across the country on Southwest. In South Carolina, a nine-pound goldfish was found swimming in a lake. Uh, Experts say goldfish this size tend to live long because they're unflushable. And lastly, the National Enquirer is reporting that Taylor Swift and actor Joe Alwyn will get engaged any day now. Uh, Taylor's convinced he's the one, but just in case, she's writing a better breakup song. So tonight, we've got writer and director Steve Elkins on the show to chat about his fantastic and epic new documentary, Echoes of the Invisible. Uh, Some of the images he captured and the stories he gets to tell in this film span the entire globe, and they'll just blow you away. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. G? And we are back. Our featured guest tonight is a writer and director whose work is becoming well known for its its depth and the logistical commitments made to create them. Uh, his new film documentary, Echoes of the Invisible, won the Zeiss uh, Cinematography Award at this year's South by Southwest Festival. Uh, I watched it myself the other night, uh, and it was uh, just incredibly profound in its, in its depth and its scope. Uh, please give a warm weekly show welcome to writer and director Steve Elkin. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. So, so Steve, how did you get into filmmaking and, and storytelling? Oh, kind of a roundabout way. Um, I did go to film school, uh, but you know, when I was finishing college, I I kind of wanted to get away from everything I was planning on, which was a film career, and so I actually. I realized about the time I was graduating that I had been in school my whole life and I kind of wanted to do a lot of exploring. Um, I devoted about the next seven or eight years to pretty much traveling the world. Uh, I had, I was fortunate enough to have a very unique job where I could take off whenever I wanted for as long as I wanted and I'd still come back and have work. So, so I went to, I've never done an exact count, but, uh, I, probably traveled to roughly around 20 countries over the course of seven or eight years. And I was doing a lot of still photography, a lot of writing. I was very active as a musician and a composer during that time and doing editing. And long story short, this all kind of brought me back into filmmaking at the tail end of it, because I realized that each of those um, crafts are components of filmmaking and they're all combined in filmmaking. So I I decided to kind of channel all of my efforts into more singular projects, even if they were much more complicated, which essentially became documentary films, which also allowed me to keep traveling, which was great. And 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 the interesting thing about this film, Echoes of the Invisible, is is I I presume the amount of travel that was involved to make it. Um, And like I said in the introduction, uh, I've seen the film, uh, but for our viewers, can you give us kind of a rundown of what Echoes of the Invisible is and what it's about? (laughs) <laughs> um, it's, 
after all these years, I, I still sometimes struggle to give a concise description of what it is, but kind of by design. Um, so the film is not so much a traditional documentary. I perceive it more as uh, what I've started to call a docu-reverie, uh, meaning it's more like a daydream in a way. Uh, I'm deliberately trying to use the documentary format in ways that I haven't seen it used so much, where instead of having a very clear, specific topic that you go out and interview the experts on and argue a thesis about, perhaps, um, you kind of like take in all of this information, almost an overwhelming amount of information that seems disconnected, but is edited together in a way that evokes kind of a daydream state. Like when you're you know, laying in the grass somewhere looking at the sky or the clouds and just sort of your brain is intuitively making connections between things where you might not like intellectually understand how these things are connected, but you have an inner sense of, of uh, harmonic understanding between these things. So that's what I did in this film was I took a bunch of seemingly unconnected stories that I found had harmonic underlying themes and I juxtaposed, bounced back and forth between these stories so that the viewer can go on a journey of trying to figure out what the connections are and then figure out uh, what it's actually about. So uh, the main storylines involved, I contrast the story of uh, an athlete, Al Arnold, who uh, was blind and ran, he was the first person to run all the way across Death Valley in the middle of summer, one of the hottest places on earth. Um, I also filmed um, a photographer, Rachel Sussman, who devoted 10 years to traveling the world to find and photograph the world's oldest continuously living things which were, um, she gave herself a benchmark of they had to be at least 2,000 years old and still alive. Um, I also contrast their stories with the, um, the journey of Anil Ananthaswamy, who is a, a science writer who basically went to the ends of the earth to uh, discover basically where scientists are doing the most extreme experiments, pushing the boundaries of our knowledge. Um, and finally, uh, Paul Solopek, who is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who has devoted pretty much the rest of his life to traveling on foot across the earth, following the DNA trail of our Stone Age ancestors who first discovered the planet. Um, and one of his objectives is to slow journalism down to walking pace uh, because uh, the way our picture of the world is generated through news is very different when it's slowed down uh, as opposed to like journalists parachuting in and out of stories and locations just to meet the next day's yeah, he, he seemed to, it, 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 what I got from that is that there are stories in between the stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and sometimes yeah. the stories in between, mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry mm -hmm. about the lag there. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. It's just a, it, you know, it's another way to explore connections of our very complex world that oftentimes get bypassed simply by the nature of how news is generated these days. Well, sometimes it seems that sometimes the stories in between the big, what you would consider to be the big stories are actually more compelling and more human stories than the big flash stories. And I think uh, I saw some of that, you know, along his walk, um, mm -hmm. you know, by, by all means, what made you think you could pull off something that was like this grand with this much specialized footage, travel and overall scope? Was it the travel you did earlier that made you realize logistically you might be able to pull it off? That probably played some part. I'd say the, the real answer to your question is my own personal madness is probably what made me think I could pull it off. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had been kind of traveling to a lot of extreme locations around the world. And um, actually, even my previous documentary, The Reach of Resonance, I was going to some pretty extreme locations, uh, which I felt kind of prepped me for um, the unusual conditions in which I'd have to film this project in. So that helped a lot for sure. Was there a any shooting or scenes that you were trying to get that you were worried you just would, wouldn't be able to pull off? Yeah. Um, I mean, most locations I went to had their own unique circumstances, but for example, the very first place I flew to, um, overseas was Chile and I was filming at very high altitudes in, in the Andes where astronomers are doing work looking um, to parts of the cosmos we hadn't seen before. And it's a high enough altitude that you not only need an oxygen mask to breathe and you need constant medical supervision, um, but I, what I found is that film equipment, specifically electrical equipment, tends to fail at such high altitudes. Um, it wasn't just the altitude, it was also the cold as well. So for example, 
example, my external recording device that I was recording all the footage to would constantly freeze and malfunction in the middle of shots. And basically, we just had to have a lot of patience um, and try to work through the altitude sickness we were fighting off while, while trying to get those shots in the first place. So it was very challenging everywhere I went for different reasons. There is a scene where it looks as if you pick up part of an eclipse or an entire eclipse. Was that was that by design? Was that happy accident? Was that was that CGI and fake? What was that? Was that a real eclipse? It, it was a real eclipse, but uh, I actually did not film that particular shot, though it was at a location I was at filming. Um, I actually wasn't there when the eclipse happened, so I had an astronomer um, film that footage, and he let me use it. An astronomer who's on site year-round. Got it. So, Got it. Yeah. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to go to a break so we can pay some bills, and then I want to come back and talk more about the film and more specifically some of the people that were in it and, and a little bit more of the, the, the logistical challenges and, of course— uh, the award at South by Southwest. So uh, we will be right back uh, after these messages with Steve Elkins. And we are back with director Steve Elkins talking about his, uh, his film Echoes of the Invisible. So when you were putting together the story, how did you decide what stories and people to include? And, and how did you go about finding those people? Or did you already know some of those people? I was inspired by what is the connection between these people who seem like they're from very different walks of life, monks, scientists, and artists, and trying to find what that root impulse is that connects people to diverge into those different paths. That's really what sparked the film initially. So what I did was I, I went out to some uh, environments where I knew uh, scientists were pushing the boundaries of our knowledge, like the Chilean Andes I mentioned earlier. Um, I had... Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Uh, well, what I discovered very quickly was that scientists and monks, it wasn't just in the southwest of the U.S., around the world, uh, typically they would go to the same environment. So I looked for the most interesting environments in which I'd find both of those people, as well as artists. And that led me to the specific locations that I filmed in, which eventually led me to the people. So this would be, obviously, the Chilean Andes, uh, to the Himalayas in India, to uh, remote cave monasteries uh, in northern Ethiopia, to uh, Siberia, uh, where I was filming on the frozen surface of the world's oldest, deepest lake, uh, half a mile under the earth in an abandoned iron mine in Minnesota, lots and lots of extreme locations. Um, one thing I'll add, though, is that the very first person I filmed for the project was the Death Valley runner, Al yeah. Arnold. Al. And initially... Um, Initially, I was going to film the Badwater Marathon, which is an official annual marathon that is uh, held in his honor. Um, they basically, basically, some of the craziest runners in the world run the same route he did across Death Valley. But instead of uh, finishing their run at the peak of Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the continental U.S., um, they stop at the, the base of the mountain, basically. Um, and when I tried to film that marathon, I ran into some legal and logistical difficulties and, um, I basically wasn't allowed to do it, but that's how I discovered that the whole marathon was essentially in this one man's honor who did it alone with no intention of publicity when he did it in the seventies. And, uh, I found that that was a much more, um, intimate and human approach to what I wanted to convey through that insane run is it's one blind man's attempt to deal with his, inability to orient himself in the world through visuals like most of us can. And his mental toughness overall, I think, was yeah. was compelling. Um, you know, and, and, then, and then the sad irony, you know, of him having accomplished this and then soon thereafter having, I don't, uh, you know, I want people to watch the film, but, you know, people are going to Google anyway. But, but you know, tragedy... <laughs> you know, that would, that would inhibit his ability to do what he seemingly loved most. Right. And it's interesting because when I was constructing the film, um, originally I was a little worried that there'd be too much overlap between, um, his story and Paul Solipex, um, the journalist who's walking across the earth, because here's one person who's just trying to get across one environment, no matter how extreme. Uh, and here's another person who's just, you know, trying to get across the entire earth. But later I realized that that tragedy that, that Al goes through um, is really the heart of his story and what sets it apart from the others. Because I feel like his journey truly begins when he has to grapple with the tragedy unfolding with his journey. 
my wife watched it with me and she got emotionally choked up, especially when they were talking about some of the people who, who walked with him on this journey and some of them would stay on longer. And the one fellow who had stayed on and stayed on and then eventually had to be life flighted because he had a medical condition he was hiding so he could continue to walk. Yeah. I mean, that's some pretty yeah. impressive things there. What was your experience like with Paul and his story and how did it how did it personally affect you? Well, the specific detail you mentioned about Paul and his walking partners um, affected me very deeply. I was also very moved by it and felt it was very important to tell as much of their stories as possible. Um, and because ultimately, Echoes of the Invisible, I want the experience of watching it to start out where maybe you're looking at the people, you know, the featured people in the film and thinking these are extraordinary, mind blowing people doing seemingly uh, impossible things. But by the end of the movie, I hope that there's a, uh, a transition in your experience where you start to think, yes, these people are extraordinary, but they're also me. I mean, in the sense that we all have our own uh, untapped capacities and potential that, that we don't always dip into. Um, and I like, I felt like what Paul reveals through his walk is that what he's doing is actually quite normal. It is extraordinary, but, um, and the film goes into why it's normal. And the fact that um, that's exemplified by so many of his walking partners, uh, not only wanting to stay on for so long, but accepting challenges that even Paul didn't have to face because they felt that it put them in touch with some aspect of themselves that was missing from their normal lives. I felt that was a really important aspect of it. Another interesting point I think that the film raised was how being a pedestrian bordered on being criminal um, and, and how we are so expected to be in a vehicle and on some mode of transportation that if you're not on a mode of transportation, there must be something wrong with you. You must be crazy. You must be, you know, or you might just be guilty by virtue of being presumably poor. And so mm -hmm. therefore, if you're on foot, something's wrong. There's something nefarious about it. And the fact that he was, he was held up either arrested or held up or detained so many different times in the course of his journeys in all these different countries simply because he was walking. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, I felt like he really illuminated a very profound aspect of our modern experience. And for me, uh, living in Los Angeles, which is very much a car bubble culture, um, I, I do feel like he highlighted something I experience here every day, which is that if you don't have a car, you're kind of not a part of the the culture and you're assumed to be homeless, uh, which, you know, in our culture has these weird uh, negative stereotypes about it typically. Uh, but traditionally, human beings are nomadic and migratory. Uh, and but the way that I mean, all kinds of things are set up in our modern world, whether it be political borders or um, uh, the development of technology, uh, the fact that uh, driving cars is more normal than walking these days, all these things kind of combine to to make certain aspects of the human experience seem obscure and archaic, which are actually the most normal things that our bodies are literally biologically built for. Thus the, thus the title echoes of the invisible. Yeah. That's one of several meanings of the title. Yeah. I'm um, sure. Uh, is Paul still walking now? He is. Um, you know, the last I spoke to him was, I think, a few months ago, so I'm not exactly sure where he is right now. And usually it's concealed to some degree for security reasons. Um, but uh, I, the last I talked to him, he was in Myanmar and was attempting to cross the border into China. Oh, wow. And it's a very difficult time, of course, uh, you know, at the end of 2020 to be uh, crossing over into China well, for that, many reasons. That's the neck of the woods my wife is from. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, she's, where, where, from, she's from Manipur, India, which is right on the, the Myanmar border. And, oh. uh, and ironically, she told me stories of when she was a child and they would go on these 10, 20 mile treks to that border, which is, no which is interesting. Um, so wow. how long did it take you to film everything that you needed, given all the places that you went? I mean, I got to presume it was a really, really long time. Well, the full span of time I was working on it was about seven or eight years, um, but I wasn't working on it perpetually through that whole time. It was very intermittent. You know, I'd spend like maybe a few weeks on a trip here and then I wouldn't do anything for several months, a few weeks on a trip there, and then editing sporadically over the years. 
So it's hard to say exactly how long it actually took. I mean, honestly, if it were just the filming and editing, it might have taken about a year total. But it was spread out over a very complex seven or eight years, um, oftentimes because of the specific environments I filmed in were very difficult to get into, not just physically and logistically, but sometimes politically. I had to sometimes wait several years to get uh, visas from governments to enter into certain zones. Um, so it was very complex, and I had to have a lot of patience. But, you know, slowing down is one of the themes of the film, uh, the value of it anyway. So I got to live that out myself in the process of making it. So, so how did it feel and where were you when you found out that your film had won the Zeiss Cinematography Award uh, from South by Southwest? Um, I think I was shopping for um, some ingredients for a sushi lunch I was making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it, it, we were supposed to find out at the festival, of course. Yeah. Um, I was planning to be there in person, uh, and so I presumably would have found out at the awards ceremony, but uh, the lockdown started literally uh, just a few days before we flew out and before the festival started. It was right on the cusp. So, uh, so yeah, I was at home and I, I got a, a, a phone call from one of my producers that we had just won. So that was a very strange experience. So uh, now you've come to kind of the end of another multi-year project that I think you're, you've been working on, right? So what can we, tell us a little bit about that. What can we expect from you next or what you're allowed to tell us about it, I guess, at this point? <laughs> um, yeah, I can't, I can't completely divulge everything yet, but I am in development on several new projects. Um, there's two documentaries that I'm focusing on pre-production on right now. Uh, one of them is, uh, how to put this? Well, it's, it's about a writer um, who is... Uh, not, I, he's relatively well known, uh, but it's actually going to be much more of an experimental film than a traditional documentary. If, if it goes the way I'm planning it, it's going to involve all kinds of mixed media. Um, it's going to involve uh, not just documentary footage, but, and historical footage, but, um, animation, uh, dance scenes, uh, choreographed dancing, um, all kinds of bizarre visual effects, um, but it's kind of a long story. So, so Steve, what is the best way for our audience to find and watch Echoes of the Invisible? Uh, it, you'll look, you'll find updates on echoesoftheinvisiblefilm.com. Uh, we have a distributor, Utopia Films, who will be releasing the film for streaming, I believe, within the next few months. So definitely be looking out for it in early 2021. Well, and I appreciate having the opportunity to have kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, the advanced, the advanced screening of it because I'm fancy like that. Um, but, uh, and thank you so much for being on the show, ladies and gentlemen, director Steve Elkins. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. That is our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope everybody had happy holidays. Uh, also, a special thanks to director Steve Elkins for joining us, taking us home tonight, still sitting in for our house band, the Mojiles, my son, Gianni.